Hello, and welcome to your show, Rediscover, where we look at scripture and we try to glean some deeper insights. Today, I want to invite you as we take an interesting journey throughout the book of Mark. In 1920, a heartbroken F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote his novel, This Side of Paradise. The narrative tells the story of a young man, Amory Blaine, as he embarks on a journey, a trek to discover love, purpose, meaning, and even some sense in an otherwise senseless life. At the end of his novel, Blaine comments, I know myself, and that is all. I've often wondered how this approach to life is experienced as we interact with relationships and other people. And this makes me think about a story. A long time ago, I began dating a lovely woman. And as young lovers usually do, she invited me to have a vacation. Now, she thought that would have been a great thing for our relationship. What I didn't know is we were going to be joined in that vacation by her whole family. I don't think it would surprise you to find out that after a mere five days, I had unbelievable tension in my neck. After seeing me struggle with a stiff neck, she finally took pity on me, looked and said, I know what you need. You need a masseuse. Now, lest I forget to tell you, we were actually in Central America. So she took me into a car, drove outside of the city, and stopped in a small hamlet. We got out of the car, entered a hut, and a woman who spoke no English and no Spanish greeted us. I looked at her, and she bid me to come in. Through an interpreter, she told me, why don't you lay flat on the mat? I began to protest and tell her, you know, I'm here because I can't move my neck. Again, through the interpreter, she motioned for me to lay flat on my back. As I began to have her massage me, I felt a bit uncomfortable. You see, first she began touching my neck. And then, well, then her arms went a little lower. As she began to touch my shoulders, oh, I could feel the tension rising as her, as her hands still dropped a little bit more. She began to massage my back. And then I really felt uncomfortable as her hands still dropped a little lower. And she began to touch my lower back. Well, I was about to get up, but I was petrified by the terror when I realized that still her hands went a little bit lower as she began to touch, well, you know what's below your lower back. I jumped off the mat and said, what are you doing? What type of massage is this? Apparently, I had made quite a ruckus because our interpreter came racing into the room. I looked at him and she said, she touched me. He couldn't believe it. Touching was an integral part of a massage. He said, well, that's what she's supposed to do. Again, I pleaded, you don't understand. She touched me. He looked at her, translated my concerns, and then this old woman said one of the most profound things I've ever heard. Why is he making such a big deal? Why is he making such a ruckus? Doesn't he realize that it's all connected? I spent quite a bit of time thinking about how I would live my life if I based it upon the simple premise that we're all connected. You see, we live in interesting times. 
At no other point in Earth's history have we been so connected. And yet, amidst this connected world, so many of us languish in isolation. We have technology that ought to facilitate our time. And yet, we live in a rhythm of life that continues demanding more and more of us. Think about your own life. And answer this question if you can. When is the last time that you stopped, breathed in the air, noticed the beautiful colors around you, and just experienced life? It seems that the great tragedy of our time is the fact that even as life ought to get easier, we become more and more disjointed. Now, some people say that this is merely a result of living on this side of paradise. Well, to those of you who think that there is no solution for the modern malady that afflicts human beings, let me take you to Scripture. If you have a Bible with you, I'd like you to consider in one of my favorite stories. It is found in the book of Mark, the fifth chapter. It is a story of Jesus as he embarks on a salvific mission. The story begins by saying that Jesus is preaching and teaching in Israel. He is moving amidst a crowd. But as he almost always does, Jesus continues to defy expectations. At the beginning of Mark chapter 5, he bids his disciples to go to the other side. You see, Jesus has been working, preaching and teaching comfortably in the land of Israel. But this, this tricky trek to the other side involves a complete paradigmatic shift in Jesus' ministry. The other side, Mark will tell us, is the land of the Gentiles. It is the land inhabited by seven tribes all the way back in the Old Testament. Part of the promise to the people of God was that when they conquered Canaan, these seven tribes, these seven Canaanite inhabitants of the other side would be expelled. Mark uses the term Decapolis, to refer to those inhabitants of, of the other side, those people with whom we want no contact, those with whom we want to remain disconnected. The other side is a place in which misunderstanding abounds. It's a place in which people have tried to adopt the religion of Israel, but they don't quite know how. It's a land populated by misconceptions. And I can almost imagine the disciples hearing Jesus' command to go to the other side, and their memory begins to trigger. Surely they have visions. Oh, visions of Jesus coming and erupting into the other side as a conquering king. Perhaps there's whispers as they travel on that boat. It's finally going to happen. Jesus is going to enact his messianic mission. So they travel to the other side. And Mark then masterfully catches what happens as they step on the shore. And Mark chapter 5 verse 2 says, And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Surely the disciples are expecting to disembark and be greeted by fearful resistance. But instead, as their feet touch the shore, they are encountered by a nude dude in a rude mood. And then, then Jesus interacts. Mark tells us that this man lived among the tombs. 
Now, often we have this problem with Scripture. We depersonalize it. So today I'd like you to ask to think about this man. No doubt he is a father, a son, a husband. This man now who is the walking dead is a story. And in him you find also the history of a community that is desperately trying to reintegrate him. That is why Mark will tell us that the people around him have often tried to bind him up with chains, which gives us the opportunity to open a parenthesis. No doubt in your life, there are people with whom you don't interact in healthy ways. Maybe they're people you disagree with. Maybe they're people that have left your circle your community, and you are desperately trying to regain fellowship, maybe a relationship with a son or a spouse or a parent has been frayed, and you're desperately trying to find a way to reunite. Well, let me tell you, you cannot restore relationships through chains. That that is the first lesson that, Matt, that Mark will tell us in his first cha fifth chapter. So here is the man, walking dead, chains broken, cuts bleeding. He finds Jesus. And notice what he says. And when he saw Jesus, for six, from afar he ran and fell before him. And crying out with a voice, he said, What do you want with me, Jesus, King of the Jews? It's almost as Mark is capturing this whole struggle that the man has. In essence, he is telling Jesus, Don't you know where you are? I mean, look around you, Jesus. You're surrounded, you're not in Israel anymore. You are in an unclean land. We are not part of you. The promises of God that have been embodied in you are no longer applicable for us. We know quite a bit about Decapolis and about that beach upon which Jesus disembarked. We know that on one cliff, you have a herd of pigs. And on the other side of the mountain, you have a Roman garrison. You see, Decapolis was the base of the 10th Roman legion, the Legio Fratensis. And the emblem, the banner that that legion would carry into battle was a boar's head, a pig. So you see, when Jesus disembarks on the other side, a side populated by misconceptions, he is really invading an unclean land. So the man tells him, what do you want with, Jesus, with me, Jesus? I am an unclean man. And you, you are an unclean. You are in an unclean land. And Jesus will ask a question. And it's a question that's poignant as he prods the very source of the problem. It's a simple question. In essence, Jesus says, what's your name? Again, the man will respond, my name is Legion, for there are many of us here. My name is Legion. Can't you see where you are, Messiah? Look around you. You've got pigs on one side, a legion on the other, and the hosts of the one that would disconnect us from you dwelling in me. I am Legion, for we are many. And he begs them. 
Jesus will take a step back. And in that same gentle voice that created cosmos out of chaos, in that same firm voice that spoke the world into existence, he delivers the man. Oh, what a scene that would have been. Well, immediately, Mark tells us that quite a bit of commotion occurs. He will say that the whole city comes to see Jesus. You can read it right there in Mark chapter 5. They are scared. For they recognize that this Messiah actually does have power. And you see, the inhabitants of Decapolis know the story. They've told it to their children generation after generation. Namely, when Messiah comes, he is going to expel us from here. So they ask Jesus to go away. And Jesus and his convoy turns, begins to walk away from the beach, steps upon that boat. And just as he is ready to push into sea, he feels the gentle tug of the man. And the man will say, let me go with you. Think about it. This man has just been liberated. And the fear is still fresh in his soul. I don't know how to live life alone, Jesus. I've been disconnected from this community for far too long, Jesus. Can I come with you? Jesus turns and tells him, go back and tell the things that God has done for you. Which ought to be shocking if you're paying close attention to Mark's narrative. You see, up to this point, Jesus' ministry has been characterized by what he calls the messianic secret. In other words, when Jesus does a miracle, he tells the people not to go out and repeat it. So what's going on here? What's so special about this man inhabiting a disjointed land, an unclean land, a land that is full and ripe with the seven tribes of Canaan. What is it about this man? Well, Jesus wants a story to be told. He wants the message to go out. But he recognizing that evangelism must be organic. It cannot come from the mouth of a Jew The notion that the Messiah has come to heal the land must come from someone that has experienced what it means to live in Decapolis. And so the story ends. And what a great story it is. I mean, think about it. Jesus has erupted into Decapolis. He has taken a descendant of the seven tribes of Canaan. He has liberated him in the midst of a place that is unclean and inhabited by a legion. He has given him new purpose and new life. But Mark's not done with us. No. Now, if you keep reading the story, you'll find that as Mark continues to construct his narrative, there are two stories that follow immediately. The first one has Jesus back on the other side of the lake. He is once again in Jewish country. And as he lives there, Mark tells us that the people began to feel hunger pains. Merciful as Jesus is, he provides a great feast. And after the feast is done, Jesus, oh, that same Jesus, asks for the leftovers to be picked up. And you know the story. You know it because Mark makes a point of recording it. 
Do you remember how many baskets are left over? You guessed it, 12. 12 baskets that represent in Mark's economy the 12 tribes of Israel. So what's Mark saying? Ah, he is telling us that this Messiah has come in order to fulfill the needs of the 12 tribes of Israel. He feeds 5,000 people and he says, the good news is God has become incarnate and he is here to fulfill your needs. Ah, I almost forgot this Messiah, the Jesus of the Gospels, he will refuse the temptation to let us and lead us into social, cultural, or even ethnic triumphalism. Mark will continue telling the story. And after the feeding of the 5,000, we find Jesus now on the other side of the lake. Once again, he is in Decapolis. And Mark presents us a sequel to the story in the fifth chapter. Due to the efforts of the man, there is now a great multitude waiting for Jesus. Again, he disembarks. And they're ready to listen. They're ready to listen because the testimony of the demon-possessed man has disarmed them. As they listen, they begin, too, to feel hunger pains. Jesus looks at them, and his heart is moved once again to compassion. Mark will tell us that again Jesus will provide a great feast. And the story is almost an exact replica of the feeding of the 5,000, save for one part. At the end of the great meal, Mark will say, that there are seven baskets left over. Have you ever wondered why Mark decided to record that? And did you remember what I told you about Jewish promises? You see, the idea had been for as long as any Jew could remember that the purpose of the Messiah was to conquer every single nation. To convert everyone to Judaism. The Jewish people were going to be the people of God, and if you didn't join them, then you would be destroyed. God was only the God of the Jews. Until an itinerant rabbi decides to step with those dusty feet on the other side and tell the seven tribes of Canaan, I too am your God. I too will fulfill your needs. So how does that impact us? How does the idea that we are all connected work in your life? How does that deal with the way you talk to that pesky neighbor, to your troublesome teenager, to your spouse who doesn't understand you, to the person in your church with whom you continue to struggle. How does that affect you as you time and time again fall into the temptation of retreating into your own comfort zone? I think American poet captures the move and the feeling of Jesus' ministry best. His name, Edwin Markham, and the title of his work, Outwitted. It states, they drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the will to win, for we, oh, 
we drew a circle that brought him in. You see, what I'd like you to rediscover today is this simple truth. Jesus, Jesus is both the God of the 12 tribes of Israel and the God of the seven inhabitants of Canaan. He is a God for all. He is a universal God, a God that transcends politics, ethnicity, and social status. That great 20th century theologian, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, probably says it best when he writes, the kingdom of God can only be experienced in the thick of foes. So, my prayer for you is that as you move forth through your life, that you may rediscover that we're all connected. Can I pray with you? God, to those of us who live on this side of paradise, we pray for the courage to move from our own comfort zone and recognize that we are all in some way connected. In the name of the one who crosses time and space in order to redeem us, Jesus, amen. God bless you.